Hi. Um, welcome to this evening's live stream. Um, for those of you uh, eagerly anticipating seeing our MP Flo Eshalomi joining us, um, I have to apologize for the um, disappointment of seeing my face again. Um, I'm Anna Burley, I'm the policy officer at the Cooperative Party. Florence has been held late on parliamentary business, so I am stepping into her very large metaphorical shoes um, until she's able to join us. Um, and I am really excited about being able to take part in this panel. Um, I think that it's a, a super exciting topic and really speaks to the kind of radical but practical tradition of the co-op party where we don't just talk about making change happen, but we get out there and, and do something about it and, and organize our communities. Um, I think we're in a, a, an extraordinary context. There is a pressing need for change. Um, you know, the work of Marcus Rash Rashford, for example, that we discussed last night with um, the co-op group shows just the, the scale of the challenge facing people and communities at the moment. But the ways in which we would usually organize and campaign from rallies to door knocking, they're just no longer possible. Um, as a local councillor, it's, it's been very strange. I've had to conduct my surgeries via, um, via Zoom rather than being able to pop round to someone's house to, to see the damp in person, for example. But the way we, we've traditionally done things can't be done like that at the moment. Um, but what we have seen over the last few months is that we respond to crisis with cooperation um, and with communities across the country coming together to help their neighbours challenge injustice um, and seek to sort of turn over and improve on the status quo. Um, so what this session hopes to look at and what I'm really excited about the speakers we've got with us is how we adapt and make change happen in different ways. Um, learning from mutual aid groups. We've got David from Yorkshire talking about the mutual aid group in his town, Howden. Um, we're going to be hearing about Black Lives Matter and I'm really excited that we're joined by Andrew from Gwent who's been able to organize despite the lockdown to, to challenge racism and injustice. And from Kemi um, who organized a very practical response to this crisis through ensuring people had emergency access to food um, in South London. So three very different examples, but all of which I hope are gonna help inspire you to take action and make change happen um, in your own communities. So rather than you being stuck listening to me for too long, I'm gonna hand straight over to Kemi. Kemi is a councillor, um, a Labour and Cooperative Councillor in Wandsworth and the Deputy Leader of the Labour Group and a community organiser. She's the founder and CEO of Be Enriched, which runs a community canteen in Tooting Battersea in Elephant Castle, as well as a social enterprise, the People, Brixton People's Kitchen. And throughout lockdown, Kemi um, has mobilised her community to coordinate direct aid food service um, to those who would otherwise be without easy access to food. So I'm sure you'll all agree, a really essential and inspiring piece of work there. So I'm going to hand over um, and hear from you first. Thank you very much, Anna, for that, that great um, intro. I have to say that when I, when I read the, the brief of this talk um, about change makers, I actually had to look up what a change change maker was because I wasn't sure that I was qualified to be a change maker so the actual definition that I found was spotting a social um, or environmental problem and having the skills or grit to do something about it and then I said yes that's me totally um, so um, but I also think that that the, a bit that's missing there is having the, the power and the influence to do something about it, which um, is something that I think at this, at these uncertain times, as, as the saying goes, is something that not everybody has been able to do. So from my own, my own point of view, if I'm going to relate um, being a change maker to what I've been up to, um, first, of, first of all, I would say that hunger has always been a problem. It's not just a problem now in good times it was a problem way before that and the problem that we faced was that the people that were coming to our community meals were now going to have even less access to food and pretty much no access to social interaction so we set about um i, I think we definitely have the skills because we've been doing this like community meals uh, saving food from surplus, saving it mainly from surplus, cooking it in with groups of people and then sharing it with the community as a way of bringing people together. Um, so we definitely had the skills to be able to do it, we just had to modify our offer so that we were offering people a delivery service instead. And we also had had the people to do it. And I have I had a whole bunch of young people that were up for doing it, but I also had this small handful of seven 
older people who bullied me into allowing them to do it. I thought they should have been shielding, but they decided that they wanted to help. And, you know, it was a very safe environment. They weren't going to be in contact with other people. So I let them get on with it, which was, and I mean, they're absolutely wonderful. If any of them are listening, I salute you a lot. You're amazing people. Thank you very much. I'm forever in your, in your, um, I don't know, forever thankful for what you did. <laughs> um, so then, so, so we definitely had the skills. Uh, we had to modify our offer. We also needed some extra skills. So we got in touch with some local chefs. I know, I know some chefs, but we got in touch with some other local chefs to help us because 40 meals and 400 meals are two very different scales of, of cooking. So we got some other chefs to come in and help us do it. And the thing about older people is they can pretty much bend the arm of anyone. So they were able to get loads of extra food as well. So our food baskets were very bountiful full of fresh fruit and vegetables as well as things like planting and yam and stuff and that was that was at my tooting project and it was really pretty good and when i couldn't get hold of food i often wondered shall i just pop down there but no that it's not the right thing to do i didn't do that um so um so then and then basically over those first 12 weeks we were banging out something like 400 400 um meals to adults and 200 to children every single week from one small community kitchen. And that's the other thing, it's, it's, it's not written here about skills, but also having the space to do it. So we had a church that let us use their space and were very happy to let us use the space and just let us get on with it as well without, without any interference which was wonderful and you know much power to them. So, uh, but then in, in addition, we had the money to do it. And a lot of organizations did not have the capital to do it. We had the money and we also had, um, we also had funding that we received from some of, the, some of the grant givers. So we were able to do it. So I guess I can say very shortly, yes, I am a change maker. Thank you. Great, and I love that. Um, I love that definition that you gave, um, and it's really inspiring to hear how you're able to scale things up so quickly. Um, I think next we are going to hear from Andrew. Um, Andrew is an anti-racism campaigner helping to initiate the Black Lives Matter Gwent group and was one of the organizers of a successful Black Lives Matter event, which saw 2000 people safely march through Newport. Now, I'm not very familiar with South Wales, but my colleague Caitlin is, and she informs me that organizing anybody to do anything can be a hard, a hard job. So that's doubly impressive um, given the, the, the geography um, uh, of South Wales. Andrew since launched a book club so that people in the city can come together via Zoom to learn about race in modern Wales and the UK, uh, which I think is a really exciting initiative that I hope you'll be able to, to touch on in your speech. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it goes without saying uh, to state the obvious that we are living through unprecedented times, at least certainly I, I know I am. I have never seen anything like it in my lifetime, I'm 22 years old. Um, and I think the, the combination, the synergy of trying to survive a, a global pandemic, uh, coupled with the urgency of our social, economic and political situation has given rise to, to new perspectives, new ideas, new solutions in, in our society. And I think when you're living through unprecedented times, it means that your solutions also have to be unprecedented as well. Um, you know, have to be radical as well, I think. And I think there's been a fear over the past uh, couple of years from, from the powers that be uh, or people who are uh, anxious about the preservation of a current status quo. And I think Black Lives Matter has allowed us to scrutinize this particular status quo and say to the people that enough is enough and that it's time that we really start putting justice at the core of what we do, not only as individuals, but also as a society and all facets of society, um, our justice system, our prison system, our healthcare system, our educational systems. And I've, I've had the, the, the pleasure to, to be in a position I'm in now leading the organization in my area. So this is kind of the context that BLM Gwent was, was born out of. Um, I took the initiative to, to organize the match and I'm now in a position where I have a, a healthy, strong foundation. I have a team 
there's about six of us in our core team and about 15 people in, in the wider volunteering team. And, you know, since uh, the match was in June, up until now, we've done amazing work. Uh, Anna touched upon the book club that we've launched. So that was kind of my, my very first initiative. I wanted us to launch a book club because education seemed to be the most prevalent theme to arise from, from the movement. We did a survey where about 400 participants uh, of the uh, attendees from, from the march, and we asked them, what do you best believe is the solution for tackling racism in Wales? And education was by far uh, the, the main thing that people highlighted. And so naturally it made sense for us to start the book club. Um, you know, we had a great steady flow of numbers, a great number of consistency. We do two, book, two books a month. Uh, we've just done Akala's Natives. Uh, and the next book is Audrey Lord's Sister Outsider. Uh, about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, we did a, a, also a panel discussion titled The Power of Education. So we had three panelists. We had Faluke Adabisi, who was a senior law lecturer in University of Bristol. We had uh, Abu Bakr Madan Al-Shabazz, who is a historian and educator and sociologist whose focus is on uh, black history throughout the ages from ancient times to contemporary society. And we also had uh, Akala as well, which was amazing. Uh, we managed to get, I think, uh, at the height of that particular panel, 515 or 16 attendees. So yeah, amazing discussion. And um, we haven't lost focus, you know, I think, I think there's not a one size fits all solution to the issues that we're facing and it has to be pluralistic and it has to be uh, community driven and people driven and that's the the sort of ethos and ideology that I wanted to ingrain in the team so uh, amongst our community initiatives at like the book club and film club I've also been heavily involved in the kind of uh, policy making aspect the legislation because you know I'm aware that the measure, uh, what was going to be the main measure of our success is actually what have we changed with the policy in Wales? And that's kind of also been my focus in the background, working with Welsh government, uh, with uh, police in my area to implement certain strategies and, and things that were highlighted in our manifesto, because we released the manifesto. That's one of the first things we worked on with eight suggestions for the Welsh government, which range from uh, preserving black cultural heritage, um, the implementation of a thoroughly embedded, accurate, authentic Black representation in our curriculums across all subjects, not just history, but literature, maths, music, art, um, things to do with uh, inquiries into stop and searches in Wales, because there is an issue with stop and search in Wales. There's an issue with tasering in Wales. Um, there's an issue of the, the privatization of prisons that's been occurring over the years in Wales. And these are things that uh, have been brought to fruition as a result of, of um, you know, what started with the death of, of George Floyd. So I think when we talk about change making, um, you have to be radical and you have to be optimistic and you, you have to be imaginative. I think the situation we're in now has allowed for imagination to flourish. I wanna, I wanna imagine solutions that perhaps we were never entertained before, but we're in a time where these solutions are potentially what is gonna drive our society forward and benefit not just black and brown people, but our society as a whole. And that's kind of my viewpoint. And, and I, think, I think what I can say about the current situation is that it's, it's allowed us to have the often candid, difficult conversations that people used to try and avoid, but now there's no avoiding it. Um, these, these particular discourses are in the media, they're on your social media, they're on the news, your, your colleagues are talking about it, your children are talking about it, everybody's talking about it. And this is exactly how change happens from, from conversations, but then turning conversation in, into action. Great, thank you. And, and just a very quick follow up, if I may, before I move to, to David. Um, obviously, it was a, a huge uh, issue in the news, both sides of the Atlantic, um, when George Floyd was killed. Um, and, it, you know, the timing wise and, and the compelling nature of the argument gets people involved. But how, um, in terms of actually practically getting those thousands of people together to, to do something about it, rather than just shout at the TV, how do you do that when you can't pop around their houses? Um, I think we had we had the um, we had the benefit, I guess, of the the highly publicized and gruesome um, nature of the death of George Floyd, which everyone had seen. 
And I think black, brown, you know, whatever color you are, just seeing another human being die in that manner, I think triggered something in people that we didn't necessarily have to do too much to push people to be there. I think everybody actually wanted to be there because everybody recognized just how, how horrific that incident was. And uh, we were, I organized in a week. Uh, we, we only had one week. So I think just pulling together the resources we had, I had a great team, as I said, working with an, a youth organization called Urban Circle in, in Newport. And we just tapped into the, the natural um, kind of resource and traction and momentum that was already being gained anyway. And, you know, we, we also try not to focus too heavily on numbers. It was one thing that came up, you know, police were asking me how many people you're expecting people. And it's one thing I tried to detach myself from because I knew whether we had 50 or 100, as long as people come there with the right frame of mind and they're willing to listen and are willing to act on, on things, because that's ultimately what it comes down to, then we would have succeeded, you know. And then when I turn up on the day and I see thousands of people in, in you know, small small Newport, it was, yeah, it was, it was incredible, very incredible. But I think, um, I think, yeah, living through a pandemic and, and as you said, the compelling nature of, and the relationship between COVID and also what's going on socially, I think ignited a spark that was inevitable, you know, was inevitable. Thank you. So now we're going from South Wales up to rural Yorkshire. Um, so we're really taking you on a, a tour of the country today. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce David Howard. Uh, David is one of the community organizers behind the Howden Helpers, a mutual aid group um, up in uh, Yorkshire. Howden, unsurprisingly. And um, he also pre-pandemic organizes uh, Christmas and Company, providing a Christmas day lunch to people who would otherwise be alone and supported in the local food bank while he's at it. And um, he's a town councillor and an event producer and filmmaker. So uh, has a much better familiarity with our behind the scenes uh, tech here than I do, certainly. Um, and really interested to hear how sort of why your mutual aid group succeeded and, and you know when we talked uh, before you joined um you, we, we talked about how actually some have done really well and some have have fallen foul of, 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 of bickering or, or haven't been able to to create something sustainable whereas my impression from howden is that you've not only been able to meet the crisis but create something that's going to outlast the crisis in a really positive way so i will hand over to you to share some pearls of wisdom please Thank you very much. That's two thirds of my presentation out of the way, which is great. <laughs> so, yeah, my name's David. I'm a freelance event producer. I was born in London. I've worked in music and live theatre and conference production for the last 35 years. Introduction to Howden. It's a little place in East Yorkshire. We're equidistant from York, Leeds and Hull and about three minutes off the M62. So if you're passing, I can recommend some really good tea shops. Uh, in terms of demographics, we've got about five and a half thousand people in the town and another 1,500 in the kind of immediate villages. 30% of the population is over 65 and 30% of the housing stock is social housing. So it's, it sounds idyllic, but it's just a normal Yorkshire town. Our MP is David Davis. Um, there's not a surprise that uh, he's in a seat that's been held continuously by the Tories since 1837. So we might just manage to get people's food on the plate, but we won't get rid of them. It's not a rich place. It's a market town. Uh, on the outside, there are landowners and there's lots of agriculture and the money comes into the town in the shopping. But it's a small high street. We've got an 11th century minster and it's the place where the R101 was built. And that's, that's all that we're famous for. Uh, Dawn, my wife and I moved here five years ago from York. We were attracted by lower house prices and a slower pace of life. And as I've been moaning about things for all my uh, life, I suddenly became a town councillor so I could moan about it with a job. Um, as Anna said, we have this thing called Christmas in Company, which was basically us trying to substitute the fact that our kids weren't going to be with us on Christmas Day for the first time. We ended up with 80, uh, 48 people having a three course meal in the local hall with three Prosecco, wine and beer on arrival and a sing along to finish. Off the back of that, we raised over 800 quid, uh, which went to the local food bank and to mind. And all of the ingredients were either supplied at cost or by donation from local traders. Did it again last year and we managed to build it up to 60 people and did we did 12 takeaways. 
and we gave about seven or eight hundred quid to the local food bank, which was lovely because someone sitting down for Christmas lunch was giving people food for the next month, which has a perfect circle to it. Back in February, it became apparent that COVID wasn't going to be a small thing. So we started to think about what we could do to support our Christmas and company customers who are on their own, who are vulnerable, who are lonely. We were talking about this and a couple of friends posted on Facebook suggesting a meeting about setting up a COVID support group and off the back of that Howden Helpers was born. Within three weeks we had 150 volunteers which is far more than we needed and over 200 registered customers. We sent 5,000 5, flyers around town and the surrounding villages. We pulled up four dedicated phone numbers. We bought mobile phones. We recruited and trained a group of volunteer call handlers who would take orders and answer queries and we bought card readers to avoid handling cash. We created a suite of Google forms for customer registration, volunteer registration, shopping orders and so on. And at the beginning, there are loads of stories about scams, people knocking on doors and taking money off vulnerable people and not getting their shopping. So we decided we would shop first and take payment later, which was a really bright idea. But then we realized we needed money. Um, to be honest, Everyone was great. Town Council was great. They paid the setup costs and promised to underwrite the, going, the ongoing costs if we, they needed to. I had a very interesting tea with the local Rotary Club, which was an education. It was an interesting night. Um, they sorted out our banking, being a charity, and we got a £500 donation from the shopping float. So it was worth eating that chicken. Um, one of the issues that I discovered purely practical it's really hard to get a bank account if you're not a limited company or an association or a statutory body um it, we tried for three weeks and it wasn't happening but the rotary gave us a bank account and they're now doing our audit and everything else i'm going to move my page now right how to do it uh, i'm an event producer I, I have ideas with no real concern about how you execute them i just have ideas and throw them then that happens and my ideas tend to have to live for about two and a half hours um thankfully dawn's a business analyst and she likes to analyze every step and stress test every concept until she's happy and despite this causing a little more than the, uh, the average marital strife it turned out to be an ideal match of skills so we started off by adopting three guiding principles. Sensible, our actions should address the most relevant and immediate needs. Sustainable, systems should be robust as the, issue, as the issue is going to last months, not weeks. And we're looking at maybe, well, we are going to be starting again very soon, I think. And safe, it was vital that our actions didn't increase the risk to our own or anyone else's health. Our target group were target audience were the elderly and vulnerable. Obviously, people over 70 have been told to self-isolate. And whilst many had family or neighbourhood network supports, there were many, many more who didn't. And those people who self-isolated or became infected, and those numbers grew and waned, we've still got now, I think, about six households with positive COVID tests and people being ill as of this moment. First thing to do, most obvious thing to do was shopping. Uh, the cooperative in Howden, so the big shout out for the cooperative stores, were amazing. They opened an hour early for us so we could do all our shopping and they even let us have our own, gave us our own dividend cards. So we managed to get all the delivery petrol paid for. Um, we managed to do all of it in the end with a shopping team of 12 people rather than doing a buddy system where one person was looking after somebody else's shopping because to be honest if you do that you have the same number of people going into the same number of shops and you don't reduce social distancing and footfall our local traders were worried because obviously footfall on the high street diminished uh, so we talked to them and we set up a volunteer delivery service so that we would take let them take telephone orders and deliver their uh, goods for them for no charge and the result of this um, is that some of the local trainers tra turnovers have seen their turnover traders have seen their turnover increase year against year and that number still sustained so that's lovely that's one of those great sort of hidden benefits we also recognized that alongside illness some for some people cv19 would lead to financial hardship so we set up a community larder uh, which allowed us to augment the shopping baskets of people who couldn't get out of the house or simply couldn't afford to eat 
we had a deal with a deal. We had an arrangement with, with Boots and the local surgery, and we were able to order prescriptions by email every morning, make one collection in the day, and we had a delivery of tea, team of three who delivered 300 odd prescriptions over a 12 week period. Um, never, by the way, go to the back of a boot store with a, uh, a burner mobile phone at about three o'clock in the afternoon. You look really dodgy. Um, another part of what we did was we realised it was it was obvious that isolation was going to be very hard, very lonely and depressing. We could deliver prescriptions, deliver food, even walk their dogs, but we had to consider psychological needs. We recruited 20 listeners, um, each had a number of clients and their role was to keep up regular contact, call them regularly on a, an arranged day once or twice a week to make sure they were all right and relieve the boredom. Find out if they knew of anybody else who was ill so we could get in touch and see if they needed our help. A lot of our audience aren't obviously on social media, so word of mouth was vital through all of this. And they also wrote up a short anonymous contact report on every interaction. So if they got ill, they had to pass that person on to another volunteer. There was already the beginning of a conversation before they started. And we were very lucky because we had a great resource pool to pull, pull from. We had a senior social worker who drew up a robust set of safeguarding principles. We had a psychiatric practitioner, we had two psychiatric, psychiatric practitioners on call for any difficult calls and a great relationship with the local surgery, pharmacist and social prescriber. Other things we did, we had a books, book and jigsaw exchange. I never realized quite how important interesting jigsaws are, but now I know. Uh, we did a, we got funding from a local business and we did free Sunday lunches for people who uh, wouldn't get a hot Sunday lunch, which was delivered from a local restaurant. We gave away 500 flowers, plants, uh, at one point because the local nursery was shutting up. So we delivered them to all our customers on their doorsteps. It was like flower bombing, it was marvellous. We did gardening and mowing lawns and mowing council estate uh, public areas. We've repaired dishwashers, put up blinds. Um, and that's kind of still going on um, because the people who do it and the people they're doing it for now know each other and they just get on the phone and ask, which is lovely. Um, at the minute, we've got a buddy system going on for the shopping. We're only shopping for 15 households, but we're gearing up now to step up. Uh, we've got an on, our, now got an ongoing arrangement with the local food bank, the one we gave money to, and they're now going to provide us with food parcels in town when needed, and that's going to start next week, and I fear that may have to become a permanent service. So in total, over lockdown, we delivered 560-odd shops with a turnover of about eight and a half, nine grand. 300 plus prescriptions and 400 deliveries for local traders and um, I think about 60 on average about 60 phone calls a week over that 10 week period down to about 15 or 20 now that's us I've got a bunch on lessons learned but I think maybe that could come into something else <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think lessons learned is something that uh, I'm hoping we can uh, hear from from all of you. Um, I think that it's been such a an, a strange time, and especially as half the country's in in lockdown to various degrees already, and um, we're we're sort of looking to to the second wave. What what we sort of take away from the first attempt and do better next time um, is certainly important in some of those immediate responses to COVID. And then sort of that wider piece that I think brings all three of you together, um, maybe more obviously in my head than, than everyone's, is actually we're all here because we are tackling inequality and injustice in some ways, whether it's a failure of the state to provide food to people who need it, whether it is endemic, uh, racism that, that sits across society and the way our economy works, whether it's um, sort of access to basic things um, in, in South London. So sort of that tackling tackling inequality obviously has that short term requirement, that emergency response. But as all of you have talked about in different ways, actually, there needs to be something sustained and sustainable um, that helps to 
uh, make sure that we are sort of avoiding the need for mutual aid groups perhaps in the future because we've got the, the systems in place and, and so on to, to, to deliver things that people need. Um, I've got a few questions. So rather than me chatting too long, I'm going to go on to um, those. We have, and this wouldn't be a cooperative party event if there wasn't mention of Mondragon, so apologies. Um, but Dick Simmons says, uh, in 1940, the Basque priest, um, and I'm not going to try and pronounce his surname, uh, started a Mondragon cooperative town under the nose of a fascist regime. Um, less extreme, but surely can we start the alternative economy already, despite a government that doesn't uh, seem willing to without them even noticing? And I'd argue that, you know, we, we already are. But um, I guess a slightly different situation. Andrew, you've got a, a Labour government in Wales, um, but we've got a, a Tory government nationally. Um, there's been sort of some unwillingness perhaps to uh, take some of the steps that would help reduce racism at a national level. We've seen MPs say that they don't want to do unconscious bias training, for example. Um, how do we create change? How can we get on with it? If we're not necessarily going to manage it nationally and you mentioned this a bit because you're you're working with say your local police but what what, what do you think about that question um that's why i kind of say the, the blessing of my geographical location obviously being in wales has, has ensured that the Welsh government has actually engaged us from the beginning and have taken an active role in uh being up to date with with the demands of the people and not just being up to date uh, and you know just giving us lip service but actually working on a race equality action plan which they aim to implement by march 2021 and we're on on the kind of forum for that so we've had great success just because of the nature of uh, our government and obviously the political situation in wales whereas uh, you see how polarizing and turbulent is being uh, uh, in england and i'm actually i'm actually moving to london this weekend so um okay. yeah that's where uh, I'm gonna <laughs> southeast actually to be specific so I'm gonna have to obviously find a way adapt myself and my strategies now uh, where my physical locality is not gonna be in Wales but actually gonna be in England and I think the answer to that is um yeah the the power is within the people at the end of the day um we I say we people elected the the current prime minister um and they're human beings just like us, which means we also have our own power as individuals to organize and uh, to strategize and to, um, you know, take back some of that power that has kind of been taken away from us because of the situation. So I think um, it works and the way that kind of oppression works is with apathy. If you have the feeling that, oh, is there really much point in doing what I'm doing since we're fighting against um, a government, a, a specific government, you already, you've already lost the battle, you know, so there, there has to be a certain level of optimism uh, to stop yourself from being apathetic and, and to, to trust in the power of, of your communities and the, and the power of the people. Uh, and I think we've seen the results of that, of that uh, trust and faith in, in community action and community power. Um, and so from sort of a future South Londoner to a current South Londoner, Kemi, optimism must be crucial when you're when you're setting something up and, and there are barriers that you hit, but you've obviously gotten on, on with it, not only with a, a Tory government nationally, but a, a Tory council um, that you're sort of having to, to challenge in Wandsworth. Um, how do you sort of get buy-in of people that don't necessarily agree with your politics, but might be able to help make something happen? First, in a true politician style, I just want to say something I discovered today that um, the Black Lives Matter movement has achieved was um, Little Britain and another show, uh, the one where they have the pig nose, um, League of Gentlemen, has been taken off whatever streaming platform that they had on because of blackface. I, I had no idea that had happened, but I think that that's definitely a step forward. But um, in terms of government didn't ask for that to happen. That's something that a business did. That's a company that did it because the, this government will basically do what companies tell them to do. So maybe you, maybe it's about hitting hitting companies and making them change the way that they behave in order to influence government, which is a totally backwards way like a country should be run. Now, in terms of uh, local politics, I actually had a full council meeting yesterday. Oh, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> it was just it was it was painful it was awful um are we allowed to say that like that Tories are racist because Tories are racist and like maybe not all of them are but a lot of them are and um just even the way that they the way that they would we we have um in Wandsworth we have um John Archer who was the first black um mayor but also leader of a political leader of of any council um in in London and John Archer started off in in Wandsworth and this year you know black lives suddenly matter this year so they want to um erect a statue of him um they use the term afro-caribbean in their in their actual you know proposal which i was was affronted by it, to be honest, because Afro is the hairstyle, Caribbean is an area of the country. But when I brought this up, I was met by, that's just the term that we use. Nobody uses that term anymore. Anyway, no one uses that term anymore. So when you're dealing with, you're, you're trying to get through these tiny, tiny little things before we can approach a much bigger systemic racism. And I can di directly relate that to food when I'm just asking people to make plans in case the government don't provide holiday food for children, we should have a backup plan. And the answer is no. <laughs> and that's food for children. And they are, they are the little thing. Um, you can't, I, can't get, I can't get this council in, in um, whilst we're in opposition, I can't get them to even write a food poverty action plan. So that's, you know, that's even without a date. I'm very pleased that Andrew, that you have a date for when this is going to be implemented because most often action plans are written and then they just sit on the shelf. Fair enough. It sounds frustrating, although I'm, I feel like you do approach everything you do with great optimism as well. So, you know, it's not wearing you down too much. David, it's slightly different challenge possibly in your um, in your town, but sort of perhaps for you, it's more that you've got people who haven't necessarily volunteered or gotten involved before um, and are doing it for the first time at a time of great crisis. How, what, what have been some of the challenges there and, and how do you sort of get on with it um, and it sort of help create some of that structural and social change perhaps um, without uh, and bringing people from diverse politics with you? Um, it's going to sound quite controversial, but rampantly apolitical uh, on the surface and avoid publicly making any political statement. I mean, we can, I've been a Labour Party member for the last 15 years and I'm a, a Labour Party voter all my life. So my tongue's been bitten a lot, but there's no point in alienating people um, just over something like that. These days, breathing is political. Everything we do, everything that we've done here, everything everyone's doing that's helping somebody else is a political act. Um, let's not put flags and banners on it when we're having the argument. Um, Kelly spoke about power and influence. I mean, I substitute it with bloody mindedness. And if somebody's, if I'm asking for support, I'm say, we're going to do this and leave it like that. It's going to happen with or without you. And you better get on board. Otherwise, I'm going to tell everyone you wouldn't help. Uh, if they say why not, then um, and if they refuse you, just say why not, because that gets you through the not made here syndrome. With volunteers, it's about communicating. We had far too many volunteers to begin with. And at the beginning, we were trying to make jobs up for people. But in the end, it was more important for the project for it to work that we skinned it down to the most efficient teams. And yeah, you'll get some volunteers who are virtue signaling. They want to be there and they want the re they want the best job and they want the high vis jacket and they want to turn up once a week. Um, and some are lovely and well, they're all lovely. I hope they're not watching. Um, but so long as you talk to them all the time and get them engaged, and we gave them their own Facebook plat Facebook platform where they could discuss stuff. And everything we ever did from the day we sort of got moving was, hey, chaps, we're thinking about doing this. What do you think? We'd still do it, but we <laughs> uh, some form of sort of level of democracy. Um, and that keeps people rolling along. And it's about communicating. It's about sharing. It's about thanking. And anyone who's volunteering is basically nice. 
no matter which way they vote. And if they're nice, they'll do for me at the moment. We'll sort ourselves out on our um, cultural and political differences after. Oh, great. Um, so the, the next question um, is from Elsie, and I'm afraid maybe slightly political, um, but that sort of lots of what you've all been doing has been stepping up where the government hasn't, um, filling gaps in provision or meeting need that hasn't been addressed in a, in a crisis or, or tackling an issue that the government isn't seemingly prepared to, to, to grapple properly. Um, what do you think the government could learn from the work that you've done and the communities that you work with? So I'm going to go backwards. So I'm going to come to David first, if I may, as you're on my screen currently, um, and then we'll do Kemi and Andrew, if that's all right. Uh, logically trickle money down to us directly. Uh, we don't, rather like test and trace, we don't need centralised help. We need help in the place with the people who can deliver that help straight to the people who need it. We don't need, we've got a big one coming up because they are, they've indicated, or a government spokesman from Number 10 has indicated they're not going to do NHS food parcels for people who are uh, who were shielding and self-isolating in the last uh, run around. Um, understand why, because they don't want to tell people to self-isolate because they have, obviously, this has a major mental health issue. But the damage has been done. These people are shit, pardon me, these people are scared at the moment. Um, they spent 12, 13, 14 weeks in their houses, not going out, not seeing anybody. They get let out they see the infection curve rising and this time they're being told they can go out. Now that feels to a lot of them like they're being basically sacrificed because the warnings they had so before were so strong that why aren't the warnings there now? We can't get to those people because of GPDR, data protection, we're not allowed to find, get, be given a list of the people in our area who were shielding. Um, I was talking to a guy at East Riding at the local authority yesterday and we had this conversation. It was another one of those great moments where we both agreed it was madness that this was happening. So he's now going back to his bosses and to the NHS to see if they can deliver flyers from us so that those people can get in touch with us because we're not allowed to know who they are. That is an example of the way you can skinny things down. And it's not just funding. It's about data. It's about permission. It's about... Um, Letting us get on with it. I think that goes across everything that everyone's doing. Um, I know I've run out of things to say. No, I, I think you've hit on a really important thing there that sometimes if sort of power's exercised from the top down, you don't actually end up with solutions that has everyone's buy-in, but equally that fit the, the local area. Kemi, is that something you could come in on? Absolutely. Um, but I'm going to come on to that point last. I think things that that government could do Firstly, they need to start measuring these issues because if you don't measure the state of state of, of the issue, then how can you know what is being what you're putting in place is actually making a difference? Uh, they need to measure food insecurity. They should have been doing that before. They would have seen the level that food insecurity has risen and who it's risen for, and then they could have sent the right sort of food. And I mean the right sort of food. If any of you saw what was being delivered to like older people, that was absolutely ridiculous the right sort of food to the right people so they need to do that for a start they they need to scrap the five week wait for universal credit because in that period that five weeks if if they if they were measuring the issue they would have seen <laughs> that the people that that after about the first month after the first five weeks you could actually see the the rise in the amount of people needing support um and that's because of the five week wait maybe some other issues, but mainly the five week wait. Scrap the five week wait. Second, or thirdly, actually, this is the third point, um, the, the, the universal credit money, it's not enough. It's not realistic. So they need to increase that um, to something that's actually realistic to live off. So even when people had the money, they were unable to go out and buy their own food, right? So let's add some more money to that. And then fourthly, contract local organizations who are already doing the work and have been doing it for years instead of circo give us the 12 billion pounds right we can do a much better job so that's what i think they should be doing no i 
find very little there to disagree with. Um, and when we sort of talk about better measuring, um, that's something that I think links with what Andrew talked about around um, sort of how racism has become even more obvious through this crisis, not only because of events in the States, but because we've seen when we start to measure and look at the, the statistics on COVID that it's impacted uh, black and ethnic minority communities um, much more, um, not because of those communities, but because they're more likely to be working lower paid jobs. They might be in uh, more uh, overcrowded uh, neighborhoods and, and the, the virus really thrives on that inequality um, and that race inequality. So Andrew, I wonder if sort of what you want the government to do differently as well as some of the big asks that you know, you've had good buy-in with the Welsh government, but we need the UK government to do. Actually, how, when we go into a second wave, do we try and, uh, help uh, prevent it being such a, an unequal impact? Um, so not, not a big question at all. <laughs> the government needs to learn from, if I have a business now, how my business operates, if I can't do a particular task in my business, I'm going to go hire someone to do it. And the government needs to understand that they were grassroots organizations and people in communities who 100% are the right people to deliver certain solutions and they need the support, not support from, you know, third party organizations and third sector organizations, but from the government to say, hang on, it's okay, we don't have the solutions, but we know people that do. We know people like Kemi, like David, who are doing work in their communities to feed people like Marcus Rashford, have you said, let's put some resources and money into those people who are actually able to deliver the right solutions. But uh, what I will say is that they, they're not, the government are not, you know, they're not, they're not dumb. They know what's going on. Uh, and perhaps the political pressure is not enough yet for them to make the changes that's needed. But we've seen them, we saw the government do a U-turn on uh, A-level and GCSE results. Because frankly, the political pressure coming from all sides, from all people, regardless of race, was too high. And they immediately had to do a U-turn. And I think it's going to have to get to that point with a lot of the other situations we're talking about where the, the pressure is so much that there is actually no choice but to make these make these changes, make these differences. Um, because people are tired. And, and as you said, we've seen the way uh, COVID has absolutely ravaged our communities. Black and brown people are the ones who are hit the most by COVID. Um, and that's not because the virus has some kind of particular racist agenda, it's because of the glaring inequalities within our societies that have led to people being in positions where the virus is going to affect them the most. Um, and it's only going to get worse. We're going into the winter months, um, you know, the, the absolute confusion and uncertainty surrounding uh, the current restrictions. Nobody knows what's going on. And, and unfortunately, our government... Uh, either too prideful or uh, too far gone to come out and admit that uh, they massively messed up here and that they need the help of, of communities and organizations to rectify the absolute damage that they have caused. No, absolutely. And uh, I'm gonna sort of ask a question that's gonna hopefully help us all wrap up as well because um, we're getting on to our, to our hour. Um, it wouldn't be a co-op party conference if we weren't talking about institutions and, and co-ops themselves. Um, so uh, a question's just come through from Robert asking uh, in a very specific way, how many mutual aid groups have reconstituted themselves into co-ops or community interest companies? But I think if I widen the question out slightly, um, yesterday we had a really interesting conversation about the role that co-ops have played so far and what they were going to be doing in their in the second wave um, and one of the real takeaways was that um, the outpouring of cooperation and volunteerism has been extraordinary and people getting involved that haven't been involved before but without the institutional sort of structures so that they're able to come back for a second wave so that they're able to you know um David mentioned having a safeguarding policy for example all of those things that help the gears of, of ac uh, activism uh, run smoothly um, what what can we do to capture this sort of feeling of cooperation this want to never go back to, to the world we had before um, and create something fairer um, how do we make that sustainable I'm not sure I phrased that question very well um, but I guess is do, do we need more co-ops um, I hope the answer is yes but equally like how do we make this not just a flash in the pan um, and keep people's enthusiasm and, and keep those structures in place to keep 
uh, pushing for change. Um, I haven't taken Kemi first, and as someone who has created sort of institutions um, and was able to build on them to adapt to the, the crisis, I might come to you first, Kemi, if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. Um, so I think so, something that happened, it happened in Wandsworth and Lambeth where I operate was um, immediately both, I'm just, I'm, I'm just dropping them into it, but really immediately they both realized the importance of the voluntary sector in delivering, so not just food, but it was also like a befriending and um, picking up prescriptions and just um, also pinpointing the people that needed the most help as well. Um, and neither of them had a VCS really to fall back on. I think it's VCS, voluntary community sector organization. Neither of them had a VCS, which would be the sort of, um, they would hold all this information and they would be supporting these organizations with all of the, the, the paperwork that's needed. I believe that they like new safeguarding had to be implemented because pe people needed to volunteer really quickly. So I think that was probably lack of safeguarding that's round like England, really. I, I think like um, the DBS system had to be like fast tracked so that things that would normally take, I think once it took six months for teachers to get DBSs and all of a sudden they could do it in like a day. I had one back in four hours, that was amazing um for people so that they could visit very vulnerable people i mean they should have been doing this all along it really just the the importance of the voluntary sector and the importance of supporting the voluntary sector in order to enable them to deliver these projects just became really important now i'm not going to drop one of these councils in it but one of the councils provided um money and funding and the other one didn't you can guess which one it was they won't be listening. <laughs> um, um, and I think that's the bit that's missing. Like you can provide people with paperwork and you can support them with being able to form formulate properly, but if you're then not gonna provide them with funding, and I know it's harder to come by because everybody is going for funding, but if you're not as, an, as a council gonna provide them with funding, then there comes a point and it's a breaking point where they can't literally do any more. So I think that's the, that's the missing jigsaw puzzle. You said they're very important. No, absolutely. Um, um, over to you, David, if I may, sort of how the, your lessons learned on how you've taken a response to crisis and turned it into something that is a bit more sustainable. And, and you know, if you're needing to ramp up your operations again, what are your lessons learned and what might you do differently and how done this time, if anything? I think we've got a system that works, which is, if it's not busted, don't fix it, really, I think. And we seem to have um, a large proportion of the original sort of uh, team back together. The band's on the road again. Um, a lot of people have gone back to work, of course, which is uh, an interesting, difficult, it's a problem, nice for them, problem for us. Um, what have we learnt? I mean, <laughs> I, the thing about funding is the thing that gets me because it's quite weird and it's a totally different experience to Kemi's really because where we are there appear I'm turning money away which is insane I mean um I don't it's it's I, it must be because there's regional differences but East Yorkshire East, East, East Riding of Yorkshire in this area there's a um, an organization called Hey Smile who kind of broker uh, grant aid and there's the odd 500,000 pound grant available for anything which is weird and I don't want to be a charity vacuum cleaner because we could suck up loads of money and not spend it and somebody else could use it. Um, we've not dealt with the local authority for grant aid because huh, it was decided it would be too difficult. Um, but when we've had to deal with their offices, it's been good because people genuinely, I think, as human beings, want to help. Um, what would I do differently? I would probably just treat volunteer. Uh, yeah, the, the whole volunteer thing regarding volunteers is making sure that everyone understands that the people we're helping are the most important people on the block. I talk to them more often. I would probably write shorter Facebook posts and emails so people read them 
as opposed to me babbling on. And I will always, I guess my, the one big lesson for me on my wall here, which I can't turn the camera around, we had the sort of the mission statement, which was very grand and very sort of worthy. And it says, no one will be, no one will be hungry, no one will feel alone. And underneath it, I've written, and always remember that you're just making it up. And I think that's the point. We are um, we are amateurs, we are enthusiasts, and we'll walk to the end of the street and back to sort something out. Do we want to go on and be something else? I don't know. I'm looking at a CIC, basically for youth provision in the town. So there's a space where kids can go because there is nothing and there isn't the money from the local authority to do that. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea of that potentially being a co-op and somebody needs to ring me and tell me what I can do. Oh, well, luckily I have your number and other people's numbers, so I will, will try and make put you in touch. Um, yeah, and I, the, yeah. my learning curve as a, as a counsellor on lengthy emails versus short emails and my readership um, has been a, an important lesson learned. So any counsellors watching, um, I'm sure that that's one you can take take away too. Andrew, uh, I guess not only what would you do differently, but how are you going to do what you did in Newport in a different place? Um, so, and, and I guess that the other half of that question is the mark of a successful organization is one that can outlive the individuals who come and go from it. You've created something, set something up. How do you feel about sort of leaving it in others' hands and, and keeping that momentum in South Wales going, um, even if you're not there to help drive it? What, what have you put in place to, to make that work? Um. I always understood from the beginning that it really wasn't about me and I'm not really concerned about raising my personal profile or I'm not, I'm not egotistical. So my, my ego is not tied into my work. You know, for me, it was just about um, creating and leaving the foundations for, uh, for my locality. Uh, and I think lessons learned, I've learned that um, you can't really do much without a good team around you. Uh, a good team that you trust. I trust everybody in my team. Um, and if I didn't have that trust, we definitely would not have been as successful as a movement as we have, as we have been. Um, because, you know, people came and went. In the early stages, we were all lumped under this kind of umbrella term of, of activism. You know, people who, a lot of us had never uh, met each other because obviously given the COVID restrictions. Um, and in a sense, things being so virtual has allowed for a, a a different level of connectivity even if it doesn't have that personal aspect to it you know I could be in a zoom meeting with all the activists across Wales which simply could maybe would not have happened if we had to do that physically so there was that level of being able to organize and organize quickly because of because of the virtual reality that we're obviously living in um, but I think obviously for, for the foreseeable future um, I'm still going to oversee the, uh, as much as I can, even though um, I'm not there physically for, for a year. I'm, I'm only in London to do my master's, so I'm not living, uh, moving there permanently. But um, I'm, I'm definitely uh, sort of, I'm, I'm content with the, with the kind of structure and foundation that we've built and the reputation that we have. And, uh, you know, I trust the ability of myself and the team to move things forward. So uh, another lesson I learned is obviously to leave, leave egos at the door. Um, it was kind of like a harsh reality for me at the beginning to, to see people in it for the wrong reasons, in it to raise their own personal profile, in it to uh, virtual signal or, you know, to, to look good for the Instagram pictures. Um, but that's not what this is about. You know, this, this, is, this is really not about that. Uh, these are people's lives and well-being that, that we're talking about, that we're dealing with. And as long as I can provide the resources and, and educational tools and uh, into that those people's well-being then I will continue to do so. Great thank you and, and that's a, a very inspirational but also hugely co-op-y note to, to finish on that we are only as sort of successful as, as the team around us and that sort of trusting others and working together helps us to have a, a greater impact. Um, I'm going to call it a night there in part because my tummy is rumbling and I'm sure others are too um, but also because I only uh, asked you to come for an hour and I wouldn't want to outstay my welcome but um, a huge huge thank you to our panellists for joining it's been really interesting and inspirational to hear the experiences um, of sort of how you go about organizing um, in different parts of the country with different 
uh, communities to achieve different things, but in sort of different but uh, equally uh, successful ways, um, meeting the gaps left by government, um, highlighting the gaps left by government, um, and sort of making really tangible change happen at both the sort of, you know, Welsh government level right down to in your local community. So thank you. And I hope that our uh, cooperators um, watching today and watching um, on YouTube when, when we upload it, uh, will take some inspiration and take some of those lessons back to help organise in their own communities. Um, and we obviously have elections coming up next May, so that sort of local organising and, and mobilising is so important, but but challenging in, in the times we live in. So uh, a huge thank you. Um, thanks for everyone who has joined us. This is our last evening session of conference, um, but you can join us tomorrow lunchtime for our BAME forum uh, discussion, which will look um, in more detail at some of the inequality um, that's been highlighted through this crisis. And uh, on Saturday, we have our AGM and our LGBT Q plus uh, event looking at um, venues and how COVID has uh, made it so difficult to protect the spaces that communities value um, with a guest appearance from Tracy Braben MP and uh, the Royal Vauxhall Tavern in uh, South London. So South London represent um, are on the call tonight. So thank you, goodbye, um, and I hope to see you at one of those events coming up.